Item number 6198 Level 3 Confidential Containment Class Euclid Disruption Class Blam Risk Class Caution Special Containment Procedures A 2 km quarantine fence has been established around the village of Chemnosz, Poland. Foundation personnel is to monitor the village and the surrounding Lower Silesian Forest for any individuals attempting to enter or leave the enclosure. Civilians found attempting to enter are to be apprehended and turned over to local authorities. Cover Story 6198.10 Conservation of Endangered Species is to be disseminated. SCP 6198A instances found within Chemnosh are prohibited from consuming any SCP 6198B found there. Any individuals, including Foundation personnel, witness procuring or drinking any substance suspected of being SCP 6198B without clearance from Level 4 security personnel are to be immediately apprehended, interrogated, and then anesthetized before being released after a period of 24 hours. SCP-6198-A residing within the village that has been observed or suspected of performing any of the following activities are to be immediately apprehended, interrogated, and held in Foundation custody indefinitely. Suddenly speaking a language that isn't descended from Proto-Slavic or Common Slavic, alluding to the knowledge of the Foundation, any of its operations, or any other SCP. Performing thaumaturgic rituals directed towards Foundation personnel. Foundation personnel is advised to avoid entering the village alone during periods of time between a new moon and a full moon, the waxing phases specifically, if necessary. SCP-6198 is an extra-dimensional entity believed to be a god worshipped by 6th to 12th century Polabian Slavs, known as Chernobog a.k.a. the Black God. SCP-6198's anomalous effects are currently isolated to the village of Chemnosh, primarily in the form of all SCP-6198-A instances and any SCP-6198-B found there. The magnitude of any effects and the strength of SCP-6198's presence in the world is tied to and supported by two factors. One. The number of devotees that worship it. 2. The size of the collective consciousness contained within SCP-6198. SCP-6198-A are individuals that were born in Chemnosh, and up until Foundation intervention, had regularly consumed SCP-6198-B. SCP-6198-A instances appeared non-anomalous, however, the life expectancy of the village is notably higher than the surrounding area. In addition to this, elderly SCP-6198-A residing in the village exhibit the vitality of someone half their age. SCP-6198-B refers to a black liquid that anomalously appears within the village and can only be safely consumed by SCP-6198-A instances. Holes created in the soil within Chemnosh that are at least large enough for a human to pass through transform into SCP-6198-C instances appearing as a deep pit that features an opaque entry point. To date, an endless supply of SCP-6198-B exists at a uniform depth of 20 meters within SCP-6198-C instances. Despite this, the total depth below this 20-meter point is currently unknown. SCP-6198-C instances appear at midnight on nights of a new moon and remain until midnight of the following full moon roughly fourteen days, where they revert to the state they were in before the transformation. SCP-6198 was initially discovered in a dormant state, an incident in which a member of Foundation personnel went missing within Chemnosh has since caused SCP-6198 to enter a more active, awakened state. It is believed that SCP-6198 remains within this state. Since becoming active, SCP-6198-A instances that consume SCP-6198-B gain knowledge of Foundation operations, personnel, and SCPs known to the Foundation. SCP-6198-A instances with this knowledge 
have an extreme tendency to engage in hostile ritualistic activity directed towards the Foundation and or attempt to covertly isolate and subdue Foundation personnel. As such, any future testing on D-Class with SCP-6198-B, as well as any explorations into an SCP-6198-C instance, have been prohibited by order of the O5 Council. SCP-6198 is believed to reside within Chimnush, despite there being no visual confirmation of SCP-6198. However, sightings of a large black humanoid figure have been reported by Foundation personnel within Chimnush during nights of a waxing moon. Discovery SCP-6198 was initially discovered when Foundation surveillance teams detected radio chatter regarding SCP-6198-C instances that were discovered by local authorities while investigating a missing person report in the surrounding Lower Cilician Forest region. Upon entering the village, local authorities uncovered several SCP-6198-C instances and arranged for a support team to venture down into them. Foundation agents were dispatched and relieved local authorities of their investigation under the guise of Poland's Ministry of Public Security. Foundation agents first to the scene noted that SCP-6198-A instances were wary of them, generally keeping their distance and observing their activities from within their homes, but otherwise appeared non-hostile. Communication with most SCP-6198-A instances proved difficult initially, as the majority of the village speaks Proto-Slavic a precursor to common Slavic, believed to no longer be used within modern society. A Foundation linguistics expert was later brought in to facilitate interviews with SCP-6198-A instances and to translate any documentation retrieved from Chimnosk. Addendum SCP-6198.1 Initial Exploration Log Note, The following log is the transcription of audio and video recordings made by Foundation agents Kazimierz Nowak and Maria Bakula during the initial exploration of the village of Chemnosk on October 1, 2019. Begin Log Camera footage from Agent Bakula's body camera shows both agents approaching the remote village of Chemnosk. Its dilapidated wooden buildings are enclosed on all sides by a thick screen of trees. No signs of electricity, no roads, no vehicles. This must be the place. Both agents pass the threshold into the village. Several SCP-6198-A are seen working or conversing with each other. The SCP-6198-A start to quietly alert each other as they notice the agents. Some abruptly stop their work and quickly retreat in the nearby buildings. Not the warmest of welcomes, is it? Doesn't surprise me. If what the police claim checks out. They tend to keep to themselves. Don't even think they speak Polish. The police report stated the potential anomalies located at the cemetery. Nowak and Bakula make their way through the village, passing several ruined houses from which SCP-6198-A are occasionally seen as they peer through gaps in the walls. Hushed, unintelligible speaking can be heard coming from inside the buildings. What happened to this place? Why are people still living out here? The agents approach the cemetery. Its parameter fence is decorated in makeshift hierograms. Recognize any of those symbols? Hmm, no. Best guess, some sort of superstitious warding to keep the dead inside the cemetery. Bakula pushes open a metal gate and enters the cemetery. The agents proceed to what appears to be an open grave. Nowak pulls a flashlight out from his jacket pocket shining it down into the SCP-6198-C. The area around the entry point appears illuminated, while anything beyond the entry point remains pitch black. Seems as though any light gets completely absorbed. Hard to tell whether the black here is solid or liquid, or how far down it goes. Keep an ear out. Bakula drops a stone into the SCP-6198-C. The stone passes through the blackness without disturbing it. After a few seconds, a distant splash is heard. Interesting. So there's liquid further down there? Worth further investigation. Let's head back and call in a support team after checking in with the locals. 
Bacula's camera turns upwards, facing back towards the village. Multiple figures in hiding are seen quickly moving out of sight. Jesus, you see that? No. What is it? I just caught at least three people hiding from view as I looked up. Let's not stick around longer than we need to. Wouldn't want to overstay our welcome. The agents leave the cemetery and head back towards the center of the village. Bacula leads the way towards one of the rundown houses. She proceeds to knock on its door as she nears it. The same hierographic as seen in the cemetery appears etched into the door. Twenty seconds pass. I know someone's in. I saw them peering through the window from the cemetery. Another series of knocks is made. After a few seconds, it's followed by the scraping and creaking of wood as the door slowly opens. A weathered elderly woman's face appears through the gap. Good evening. I'm Agent Bakula and this is… The face interrupts with a rasp, speaking in an undistinguishable language. Ah, Polish? Can you speak Polish? The face at the door continues to speak in an unknown language before closing the door. Looks like we'll need a translator too. Can't say I'm familiar with the language. Any ideas? Not for definite. Sounded old though. Really old. Alright. There's something I want to check on the way out. Let's head back. The two make their way back through the village, with SCP-6198-A instances continuing to watch them in the distance. As they near a well, Nolak removes his flashlight, shining it into the well. As I thought, this well exhibits the same properties as those open graves. Keep an eye out for me, Bakula. What? Why? Oh. Nowak grabs at the rope attached to the well's winch, and starts hoisting until a bucket rises into sight. Careful, Nowak. Whatever's in there isn't water. It's black. Nowak carefully handles the bucket, tipping its black contents back into the well. Runs just like water. No scent to it either. We need to get out of here. I think the entire village is watching us. Shit. Yeah. Time to get moving. The agents begin walking at pace out of the village. SCP-6198-A begin gathering between the houses in front of them, watching intently as they pass by. After leaving the village, Bakula turns to see a crowd of SCP-6198-A watching them from the village threshold. Is it just me, or did everyone there look at least 50? Yeah, the one tailing us looks about 92. I'm impressed he's able to keep up. We're being followed? Yeah, just the one, I think. The car's another ten-minute walk, so be on your guard. The two traverse through the dense, lower Silesian forest, with Bakula regularly turning to see the pursuer standing stationary watching them, roughly twenty meters away each time. The agents eventually break out from the forest tree line and onto a road. They continue to walk along the roadside for a minute, before approaching and entering a parked vehicle. I noticed this on the table outside the woman's house, by the way. Managed to pocket it while you were talking to her. Nowak passes an old, leather-bound book over to Bakula. She opens and begins flicking through its pages. Images of hierograms, religious practices, and humanoid figures appeared crudely drawn throughout the book's contents. I can't read any of this. It looks like some kind of Bible, though. This must be written in whatever language they were using. Man, you looked through this yet? Not had the chance. You see something? The hierogram we saw at the cemetery is all over the place. There's a lot of reoccurring depictions of some kind of specter or shadow as well. Quite a few ritualistic sketches, too. We'll get the translator on it. Could be we have type blues on our hands. Noak starts the car engine and begins slowly accelerating. Heh. <laughs> The old guy kept on us. Check it out. Bakula turns to the window to see the pursuing SCP-6198-A leaning out from behind a tree, watching them. What the hell? Maybe he regularly marches through the wilderness to peer out at the roadside from behind a tree line. Sure. Just like every other spry and well-adjusted elderly person I know. End log. Addendum SCP-6198.2 Excerpt from the Retreat Book The following is a note from Foundation Linguistics Expert, 
Researcher Albin Iskra Addressed to Site-120's Translation Team Lead Director Alastair Bimhoff Regarding the Chemnosk Book Director Bimhoff Let me start by saying that, despite my extensive knowledge of the history and origin of the Slavic language, this is the first time I've ever encountered what appears to be Proto-Slavic in written form from a direct descendant source. This is a truly fascinating discovery. Initial progress on translating the text was slower than expected. There's something about the linguistic structure of the language that, for reasons I can't fully deduce, make it incredibly difficult to retain the knowledge of. For every few words committed to memory, it's as though one dissipates from it. It's as if I can feel a sense of reluctance coming from the language itself. Eventually I was able to solidify my understanding enough to begin picking at the various passages found throughout. I can confirm that the contents of the book hold a great deal of religious significance, not only for those in Chemnosk, but throughout all Slavic culture, dating back to roughly the 4th century. While there are references to the more well-known Slavic gods, such as Perun, which I strongly suspect is SCP-PL-231, and Velus, the book focuses primarily on one of the sibling successor gods, Chernobog, the Black God, detailing various prayers, rituals, and tenets that followers of the Black God should live by in practice. I've highlighted a selection of excerpts of notable interest that may shed some light on the occurrences witnessed by Foundation personnel. Researcher Albin Iskra The Rite of Black Passage for it is to him where the dead must go, and return to the roiling abyss, from which our forms are molded, to be one again with him. In this, we share in their fathomless knowledge and learn of untold and forgotten epochs, unfurling mysteries of Stygian transcendence, bestowed with blessings beyond death. At darkest hour, on the darkest night, within lamented dwelling hollows, shall Hypogean thresholds unveil, entwining submerged departed. Now relinquished of tethers corporeal, and sustained amidst blackest waters, become one with perennial ancestry, granting insight to those adherent. Expurgation and the Black Gift There are those that only turn to Chernobog when their time is at an end, and it is those that shall be offered the least when they inevitably pass. To live solely in the light of the brother is to neglect the eternity that follows, condemning oneself to the lowest echelons of consciousness. Those with wisdom and foresight do well to embrace the black gift, to forfeit a part of oneself in exchange for parts of the many. To drink of the black gift is to offer one's life in a bid to be tested of mind and spirit. Should one be deemed worthy, that which was offered will be returned but with boundless acuity and vigor. Should one's offering fall short, their essence is given to the Black God entirely. Yet, the truer they walk the Black Path, the more openly their souls shall be welcomed. Before one is to be tested, they must first be expurgated through ritual, else any sense of self is lost upon passing. This ebonizes the soul, proving devotion to the Black Path and allowing one's essence to find greater connection upon being taken in by Chernobog. The ritual must be carried out by followers in the Living Realm, now sustained by the Black Gift, with these followers bringing about a trance of blindness and drowning within the Aspirant. Should an Aspirant prove resolute throughout this trial of panic terror and asphyxiation, the Black Gift is then offered and true judgment begins. The Fall of Velez Velez, god of the harvest, livestock, earth, rivers, the underworld, magic and trickery. Much did humanity depend upon him for not only the means to survive, but also for peaceful death. Alas, where there are those with great power, there are also those that seek to claim it for themselves, and in this, brothers Belabog and Chernobog were no different. Harsh winter followed by foul harvest led to the death of the brothers' village, leaving the dead unburied atop frozen ground. Enraged at the neglect Velez had dealt them, and adamant that between them, they could govern the land of the living and the dead better than the great god, 
The brothers set out in search of Velez, their minds intent on deicide. In their journeys, the brothers overcome many challenges, redoubling their affinity in magic and honing their cunning in warfare, Belabog excelling in martial guile, as Chernobog mastered the spell. However, Velez watched the brothers, aware of their quest. In a bid to undermine them, Velez returned the body of their mother to the living world to convince them to return home with her. The brothers were not fooled, and with a heavy heart, returned their mother to the underworld. Velez continued to break their will, turning the food they gathered rotten. But again, the brothers were not fooled, as they endured putrid illusion of smell and taste, knowing that, in truth, what they consumed would nourish them. Every trick cast down by Velez was foreseen and averted until eventually, frustrated at the brothers' tenacity, Velez himself confronted Belabog and Chernobog. Velez challenged the brothers to battle, offering his godhood should they best him, but on the condition that only one may fight him. Suspecting that Velez may attempt to divide the two, the brothers had made a pact with Perrin, Velez's adversary. The brothers agreed that Velez would indeed fight only a single combatant, to which Velez acknowledged and draw up a boundary from which the battle would end. When asked who shall fight, the brother announced Perrin, and upon uttering his name, the God of Thunder appeared with a great flash within the boundary. A battle of world-shattering magnitude commenced as Velez took the form of Dragon, and Perrin harnessed the power of the skies. Despite his skill in magic and deceit, Velez was struck down and killed by Perrin. With Velez dead, Belabog claimed domain over Harvest, the Earth, and Livestock, as Chernobog claimed the Underworld, the Rivers, and Magic. Addendum SCP-6198.3 Interview with Person of Interest Note, The following interview was with an SCP-6198-A instance named Testia Kanitsina, a woman believed to be of middle age that was willing to converse when inquired by translator researcher Alvin Iskra on October 8, 2019. Begin Log Good morning. For the record, can you please state your name? Morning. Yes, I am Tesnia Kanisna. Thank you. And do you mind telling us where you were born and in what year? Oh, well, I was born here in Chemnosk in 1949, a few years after World War II, so I've been told. I must say, you're looking well for someone in their seventies. Now. Mrs. Konichna, we're interested in knowing a little more about Chimnosk. Can you tell us anything about the history of the village, or what your community does here? Well, what's there to say? We keep to ourselves now. Have done for generations. The village itself has seen better days, of course. I feel like there was a time where people would travel far and wide to come here, like the final stop of a pilgrimage. What do you think it is that gives you that impression? I… I don't know. I just… that's just the way it feels. I can see it in my memory, the way Chimnosk used to be, but I know it's before my time. The memories must be from dreams I've had at some point, though, but I honestly can't be sure. We all feel like that here. Others in the village have these same memories, you mean? Yes. Mostly the elderly, though. Memories or dreams of Chimnosk and Chernobog. The older you get the more vivid they seem to be. What can you tell me about Chernobog? We owe everything to him. Were it not for Chernobog, we wouldn't be here, would we? Can you explain? We're fortunate that Chernobog chose us to be his eyes, ears, and minds, here in his brother's realm, to help those in need to find their way to him, should they search. This is why you came to Chimnosk, is it not? Potentially. How exactly do you help people find their way to the Chernobog? That depends on how they wish to offer themselves. We are able to guide people so far, you understand, but the end of the journey is always walked alone. Sadly, it has been many years since anybody from the outside has come to us seeking our aid. Are you saying that you kill people in order to send them the Chernobog? Kill? Oh no. Those that come to us want to be respected in the eyes of the Black God. 
and he has little respect for those that are slain. No, those seeking his embrace must give themselves willingly, one way or another. And you say that nobody has come to Chimnosk in quite some time? This is true. Now I think about it, I don't recall anyone coming to us within my lifetime, but I remember it. I can recall times when they would come in their droves. The young and strong would seek the black gift, while the elderly or dying would come for black passage. And what can you tell me about these two things, the black gift and the black passage? Well, they are both ways to gain Chernobog's favor. Those that partake in the black gift and remain among the living earn the Black God's blessing. Those that choose to take the Black Passage are ready to leave this cycle and return to Chernobog. Have you taken the Black Gift? Yes and no. Like I said, I was born here in Chimnosk. Anyone born within its hallowed grounds is blessed from birth. And what exactly is this gift that's been given to you? Well, it's hard to say nowadays, really, but I do know the Black God watches over me and that he eagerly awaits my return. I can feel that. There was a time, however, where his gift offered so much more. The wisdom. The protection. The community. Thirty seconds of silence passes. Mrs. Konichna, are you alright? Oh my! Sorry, yes. I drifted off there, didn't I? <sighs> we used to be so much more. Before they took everything. Someone took something? Oh, don't mind me. I'm sorry. I… I needed a little fresh air. Of course. We could end this here for today. Thank you very much for your time, Mrs. Konishina. It's quite alright. The rest of the village may be wary of outsiders, but speaking with you reminds me of what life used to be like here. Oh, there is one thing I've been meaning to ask you, if that's alright. Of course. Fire away. Are you… a Christian? Oh, no. No, I'm not. Ah, good, good. End log. Addendum SCP-6198.4 SCP-6198-B Testing and Experimentation Samples of SCP-6198-B were gathered from an SCP-6198-C instance and transferred to Site-120 for testing. SCP-6198-B was found to contain only hydrogen and oxygen, along with having an entirely neutral pH level, despite its pitch-black color. SCP-6198-B was found to be completely opaque, even in extremely small quantities. In addition to blocking light waves, SCP-6198-B also appears to block any other form of transverse or longitudinal waves attempting to pass through it seemingly negating all energy waves that come into contact with it. A series of additional tests were performed on D-Class using larger quantities of SCP-6198-B, acquired from Chimnosk. Due to the lack of D-Class facilities within Site-120, a member of D-Class was transferred in from another nearby site. Test Number Description Result 1. A 5 ml sample of SCP-6198-B was applied to D-Class subject skin. No discernible effect on the subject. 2. D-Class subject was placed in a neck-deep tank of SCP-6198-B. No discernible effect on the subject. 3. D-Class subject was instructed to consume 300 ml of SCP-6198-B. Subject appeared fine for seven seconds before wincing and doubling over in pain. Subject complained of an intense, cold burn emanating from their stomach. At fifteen seconds, the subject could feel this sensation spread out through the rest of their body. At twenty-two seconds, the subject's skin and veins begin to darken. At thirty-one seconds, the subject's sclera begins to darken. At thirty-nine seconds, the subject falls to the floor and adopts the fetal position as their body twitches violently. Their breathing is labored. By 46 seconds, the subject has stopped moving and breathing, presumed dead. At 56 seconds, the subject's corpse continues to darken as it begins to liquefy. By 127 seconds, 
the corpse has been entirely reduced to a black liquid, confirmed to be SCP-6198-B. 4. D-Class subject was equipped with diving gear and was submerged within a tank of SCP-6198-B. No discernible effect on the subject. 5. SCP-6198-A subject was instructed to consume 300 ml of SCP-6198-B. No discernible effect on the subject. These tests conclude that anyone not born in Chemnosk that consumes SCP-6198-B suffers critical organ failure and dies within 60 seconds. Addendum SCP-6198.5 Missing Agent Report On October 11, 2019, researcher Ella Gorska went missing while performing a sanctioned dive into an SCP-6198-C instance, and has not been seen or heard from since. Agent Nowak and Bakula were on hand during the incident, assisting as dive supervisor and handling radio communication respectively. Immediately before the disappearance, audio feed from the dive was captured that supports the theory that SCP-6198 was directly involved and has potentially gained sensitive information regarding the SCP Foundation. The following log is a transcription of that audio recording. Begin Log Note, Due to the nature of SCP-6198-B's wave-absorbing properties, Communication between the dive team was performed via transmission line attached to the diver's service-supplied oxygen umbilical and safety line. Testing, testing. Are the audio and visual feeds coming through? Affirmative, Ella. Both are coming through the cable. You're good to go. Go slow down there. Lowering into SCP-6198-C now. The sound of whirling machinery can be heard. Passing through the SCP-6198-C threshold now. There's a substantial drop in temperature. I can't see anything down here, though. It's as if my lights aren't even on. Silence proceeds for the next 40 seconds. Splashing water can be heard followed by auditory submersion. Made contact with SCP-6198-B. Going under now. I am fully submerged. Swimming in it feels no different from normal water. I can't feel anything around me down here. I think I've entered an underwater cavern. Are you able to explore the cavern? I suppose. Having no visibility is going to make things difficult, though. Can you track along the roof of the cavern at least? I'll give it a try. This doesn't make sense. I can't find any roof around where I came in, or by swimming upwards. I must have gone well above the entry point by now. How far down did I go before making contact with SCP-6198-B? Roughly 20 meters. Yeah, something's not right. I've been raising for more than 20 meters. I should have reached the surface by now. Alright, and you still see nothing? Affirmative. I may as well have my eyes closed. Oh, hold on. I think I see something. Can you describe it? It's… it's hard to say. It looks like… like wind, I guess. Like the SCP-6198-B is beginning to move below me. It's like it's breathing, almost. If at any point you feel unsafe, just say and we'll pull you out. Okay, it's starting to move upwards now. Towards me, I think. Oh, it's happening in front of me as well. Actually, it's all moving. It's all breathing now. I think I can hear it breathing too. Gorska, do you need us to pull you out? Not yet. I can almost hear it. Something is calling out to me down here. I don't like this. Nowak, hit the winch. We're pulling her out. We'll continue this with D-Class. Hello? Oh, hello. How did you… Of course. Oh, the Foundation? Well, I don't think I can allow… Ella? Who are you talking to? Is someone down there with you? We're pulling you out now, hold on. The sound of whirling machinery fires in the background. Something's not right, Bakula. I… I can't think straight anymore. I need to come back up. There's so many of them down here. It's overwhelming. What am I doing here? Which one am I? 
Which am I? I- Ella, can you hear me? What's going on? Radio silence continues for ten seconds. Yes? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Ella, what's going on down there? Gorska. Ella Gorska, am I speaking to… Maria Bakula? Yes, it's me, Ella. Are you alright? Yes, I am fine now. I am ready to come back to the Foundation. I am ready to learn more. Noak, halt the winch! Get the MTF here. Ella, I need you to tell me what's happening down there. There is nothing of interest to be found within this abyss. The only knowledge worth seeking is above us. What are you talking about? What knowledge? Who is this? Please, send more Foundation. Please, I must survive. End log. Addendum SCP-6198.6 SCP-6198 Incident Report Within the following thirteen hours after researcher Gorsko initially went missing, a series of events occurred within Chemnosk involving various SCP-6198-A and Foundation personnel. October 11, 3.59 pm The requested MTF arrived at Chemnosk from Site-120. Researcher Gorska is confirmed missing when only her diving equipment is retrieved from the SCP-6198-C instance. October 11, 8.12 pm An SCP-6198-A instance approaches a member of Foundation personnel and, in Polish, inquires about the condition of researcher Ella Gorska. There is no explanation as to how the SCP-6198-A instance is aware of Ella Gorska, or why they're suddenly speaking Polish. October 11, 8.56 pm Another SCP-6198-A instance expresses their relief to a member of Foundation personnel, in Polish, about SCP-5659 not emerging early that year. The SCP-6198-A instance is questioned in regards to their knowledge of SCP-5659 and the potential emergence event, but no explanation could be given. October 11, 9.13 pm A third SCP-6198-A instance inquires, in Polish, to a member of Foundation personnel as to the current location of the O5 Council. This is met with extreme suspicion. The SCP-6198-A in question is apprehended and transferred to Site-120 to be interrogated further. October 11, 9.33 pm A group of SCP-6198-A are seen continually fetching water from the village well and transferring it into the nearby houses. Members of the MTF intervene and prevent any additional water from being gathered. October 11, 10.48 pm MTF unit, Adam Kowalski, fails to report during a routine check-in while searching the area for signs of researcher Gorska. The remaining MTF begins searching for Kowalski. October 11, 11.21 am While raiding a suspicious home of an SCP-6198-A instance, dozens of SCP-6198-C instances were discovered within the building. Symbols matching that of the SCP Foundation's insignia had been etched into the ground around each SCP-6198-C. The building was otherwise found to be empty. October 12, Midnight The MTF and Foundation surveillance report seeing dark humanoid figures lurking in heavily shadowed areas of the village. Nothing appears to be there when light is turned to these areas. October 12, 12.25 am Male screams are heard coming from the cemetery. The MTF moves to investigate. October 12, 12.27 am The MTF arrives at the cemetery. As a sweep of the area is performed, an SCP-6198-A instance appears and attempts to tackle one of the MTF into an SCP-6198-C instance. In the struggle, the SCP-6198-A falls into the SCP-6198-C. No attempt is made to recover the body. October 12, 12.34 am Tremors are briefly felt by all on-site personnel. October 12, 12.41 am An indistinguishable sound coming from one of the houses is reported. The MTF moved to investigate. 
October 12, 12.44 am. The MTF find a house to be barricaded from the inside. Breach charges are used to force entry. October 12, 12.45 am. As the MTF enter the building, they are attacked by an SCP-6198-A wielding a pitchfork. The assailant is quickly neutralized. October 12, 12.45 am. The MTF reports sounds of moaning coming from further into the house. The MTF moves forward and enters a room occupied by two chanting SCP-6198-A. Adam Kowalski is on the floor motionless between them, laying on top of markings etched into the floorboards. October 12, 12.46 am. The two SCP-6198-A do not react when instructed by the MTF to cease their activities. A second warning is given when Kowalski begins writhing and muttering. At this, both SCP-6198-A increases the volume of their chanting. October 12, 12.46 am. MTF members open fire, neutralizing both SCP-6198-A instances. October 12, 12.47 am. As the MTF retreats Kowalski, Kowalski's condition rapidly deteriorates as he begins to thrash and scream wildly. October 12, 12.48 am. MTF stationed at the building's entrance report multiple SCP-6198-A instances surrounding them. October 12, 12.49 am. The MTF gather outside the building and report that their route to the extraction point is blocked by the SCP-6198-A. The SCP-6198-A begin to move in unison, slowly towards the MTF. October 12, 12.49 am. Several MTF open fire, killing SCP-6198-A. All other SCP-6198-A simultaneously halt, before slowly nodding their heads. October 12, 12.50 am. The MTF begin moving towards the extraction point. Any stationary SCP-6198-A blocking the way part as the MTF approach. October 12, 12.56 am. The MTF successfully extracts from Chimnosk. As they leave the area, Kowalski's screaming abruptly stops. October 12, 1.22 am. Kowalski is heard unconsciously muttering about something black watching him from beneath the water. Kowalski then adds that whatever it is is awake and yearns for their secrets, before suffering a cardiac arrest. October 12, 1.23 am. Adam Kowalski is pronounced dead. October 12, 1.51 am. Security footage from within the MTS vehicle captures Adam Kowalski slowly sitting up and looking around before being noticed by another of the MTF. Kowalski quickly withdraws her sidearm and opens fire, killing three of the MTF and wounding the driver, causing the vehicle to swerve sharply and roll before crashing, badly damaging the onboard camera in the process. October 12, 1.53 am. The driver regains consciousness and begins contacting HQ. A few seconds later, the driver's side door is wrenched open. The driver can then be heard pleading with Kowalski and asking, why, before yelling in agony and having been pulled from their seat and dragged away from the vehicle. October 12, 1.56 am. The driver is heard continuing to plead and groan via the radio feed, until Kowalski eventually stops dragging them. The driver asks Kowalski what they're doing when the sound of vomiting and splashing is heard. This is quickly followed by the driver choking and coughing while attempting to ask, what the fuck are you doing to me? October 12, 1.57 am. The driver's coughing and wheezing continues until their breathing suddenly becomes ragged and then abruptly stops. Report Conclusion A response team was immediately dispatched to the site of the crash, but were unsuccessful in recovering any of the bodies of the MTF. A large pool of SCP-6198-B was discovered in the back of the vehicle, with the uniforms of three of the MTF laying within it. Following the trail of blood that led from the vehicle and into the roadside forest, the response team discovered pools of blood, vomit, and a much smaller quantity of SCP-6198-B. Neither the driver's body nor uniform was found. 
Adam Kowalski was also not found. Due to the events and discoveries surrounding the SCP-6198 incident, it is imperative that all Foundation personnel take extreme measures to ensure that SCP-6198 is unable to acquire any additional sensitive information regarding Foundation operations, personnel, and known SCPs. The Lower Silesian Forest and the surrounding area is to be continually monitored for any signs of Adam Kowalski, with regular sweeps performed by a designated MTF. In the event Adam Kowalski is discovered, he is to be contained, if possible. However, lethal force is permitted if capture is not an option. The SCP-6198-A instance that was transferred to Site-120 is to be regularly interrogated in order to gauge the extent of SCP-6198's knowledge. Fresh SCP-6198-B may be administered to this SCP-6198-A instance in order to better understand how the transfer of information between SCP-6198, SCP-6198-A, and SCP-6198-B occurs. Class B amnestics are to be administered to all SCP-6198-A instances not contained within Site-120. Once amnestics have been distributed and their effectiveness in removing Foundation-sensitive information has been confirmed, any subsequent SCP-6198-A instances exhibiting knowledge of the Foundation or other SCPs are to be apprehended and transferred to Site-120 for containment.